Hello everybody and welcome to part 15 of my NCA study guide on constitutional law. Um, this part is going to cover equality rights. So I'm just following along with the NCA provided syllabus here, uh, doing case briefs on the hyperlinks provided therein. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with equality rights, part 15. Um, so this is also section 15 in the Constitution Act. Equality before and under law and equal protection and benefit of the law. So there's two parts to section 15, part number one, every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination and in particular without discrimination based on race, national, ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, mental, or physical disability. Those are known as the enumerated uh, protections. And part two goes to affirmative action programs. Uh, so part two says subsection one does not preclude any law, program, or activity that has as its object the amelioration or improvement of conditions of disadvantaged individuals or groups, including those that are disadvantaged because of race, national, ethnic, origin, color, religion, sex, age, mental, or physical disability. First case goes uh, very much to subsection 1 of section 15, and this is Andrews versus the Law Society of British Columbia back in 1989. Big issue in this case, whether or not the requirement um, of the Law Society to be a citizen was discriminatory with respect to qualified Canadian residents who were not citizens. And... Uh, if it was uh, discriminatory and therefore a violation of section, fish, section 15, whether or not the requirement was justified under Section 1 of the Constitution Act. Uh, so the background here, the respondent Andrews, a British subject, permanently resident in Canada, met all the requirements for admission to the BC Bar, except that of Canadian citizenship. So he filed an action for a declaration that the requirement for citizenship violated Section 15, Subsection 1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. He was dismissed at trial, but, uh, or the case was dismissed at trial, but it was allowed on appeal. And uh, when it was, it was appealed, uh, the appeal to the Supreme Court was dismissed so that it did, in fact, infringe Section 15, and it was not justified under Section 1, so it was, in fact, discriminatory. Okay, so the rule uh, that comes from this case itself, from what I'm discerning, is a rule which bars an entire class of persons from certain forms of employment solely on the grounds of a lack of citizenship status and without consideration of educational professional qualifications or the other attributes or merits of individuals in the group infringes Section 15 equality rights. So two analysis uh, here. Basically, we have the Section 15 and then the Section 1. So starting with the Section 15, Charter requires a two-step approach. First step is to determine whether or not an infringement of a guaranteed right has occurred. Second step is to determine whether if there has been an infringement, it can be justified under Section 1. Two steps must be kept analytically distinct because of the different attribution of the burden of proof. The citizen must establish the infringement of his or her Charter right or basically the appellant, and the state must justify the infringement of a... Uh, so the citizen must establish the infringement, the state must justify the infringement. That's how that works. Okay, so the complainant, the appellant under uh, Section 15.1, must show that not only he or she is not receiving equal treatment before and under the law, or that the law has had a differential impact on them in the protection or benefit of the law, but show, in addition that the law is discriminatory. And if they can prove that, which they did in this case, then um, it goes to a section one analysis, which although that'll be covered more in the next part of this study guide, let's cover it here because as much practice as possible, right? So section one, first hurdle to be crossed to override a right guaranteed in the charter by section one is that the objective sought by the law or whatever it is to be achieved by the impugned law must relate to concerns which are pressing and substantial in a free and democratic society. The measures responsible for a limit on a charter right or freedom um, must be of sufficient importance to warrant override 
warrant overriding a constitutionally protected right of freedom from the Big M drug mark case. So the standard must be high in order to ensure that objectives which are trivial or discordant with the principles integral to a free and democratic society do not gain Section 1 protection. So it, to, uh, it is necessary at a minimum that an objective has to relate to concerns which are pressing and substantial, big standard, in a free and democratic society before it can be characterized as sufficiently important. So the section, second step in a Section 1 inquiry involves the application of a proportionality test which requires the court to balance a number of factors. The court must consider the nature of the right, the extent of its infringement, and the degree to which the limitation furthers the attainment of the legitimate goal reflected in the legislation. So they said in Edwards, the means chosen to obtain those objectives must be proportional or appropriate to the ends. The proportionality requirement has three aspects. It has to be rationally connected, it must impair the right as little as possible, and the effects must not so, not so severely trench on the rights that the objective, even if it's important, is nevertheless outweighed by the abridgment of the rights. So just a balancing test there. Okay, so that's a nice little background there. This goes on in RV Cap, uh, which is the second case that we're going to brief in this study guide. And the background here. Federal government uh, made a decision to enhance Aboriginal involvement in a commercial fishery. So it was called the Aboriginal Fishery Strategy. And this had three pilot programs. One of them resulted in the issuance of a communal fishing license to three Aboriginal bands. And it let these bands fish for salmon on their own in the Fraser River for a period of 24 hours and then sell their catch. And anyone who didn't have such a license was excluded from the fishery during that 24 hour period. Uh, so the appellants um, went ahead and fished within that 24 per hour period anyways and they were charged accordingly. And at their trial they argued that the fishing license discriminated against them on the basis of race. Uh, the trial judge found that, yeah, that, that makes sense, and it was a breach of their equality rights, um, and stayed the charges. And uh, the Crown appealed this, and on appeal, the stay was lifted and the convictions were entered again, uh, because the Court of Appeal upheld the decision. Um, so in this case, the, the charged uh, appeal this to the Supreme Court, and the issue then becomes whether those fishing licenses were a breach of the appellant's Section 15 rights. And it was held that this appeal should be dismissed because the communal fishing license was constitutional. As in, yeah, those charges stick. Okay, some, uh, a rule that came out of this case makes for a nice test that a distinction based on an enumerated or analogous ground in a government program will not constitute discrimination under Section 15 if, under Section 15-2, the program has a, an ameliorative or remedial purpose, and two, the program targets a disadvantaged group identified by the enumerated or analogous grounds. Given the language of the provision and its purpose, the goal is the paramount, the legislative goal is the paramount consideration in determining whether or not a program qualifies for Section 15.2 protection. The program's ameliorative purpose need not be its sole objective. Great test there. So, analysis. Section 15, subsection 1, and Section 15, subsection 2 work together to promote the vision of substantive equality that underlies Section 15 as a whole. So the focus of Section 15, subsection 1, is on preventing governments from making distinctions based on enumerated or analogous grounds that have the effect of perpetuating disadvantage or prejudice or imposing disadvantage on the basis of stereotyping. The focus of Section 15, subsection 2, is on enabling governments to proactively combat discrimination by developing programs aimed at helping disadvantaged groups by, to improve their situation. So through Section 15, subsection 2, the Charter preserves the right of governments to implement such programs without fear of challenge under subsection 1. It is thus open to the government, when faced with a Section 15 claim, to establish that the impugned program falls under Section 15, subsection 2, and is therefore constitutional. If the government fails to do so, the program must then receive full scrutiny under 
uh, subsection one to determine whether its impact is discriminatory. So some analysis here then um, with these rules. The government program at issue here is protected by subsection two. The communal fishing license was issued pursuant to an enabling statute and regulations and qualifies as a law program or activity within the meaning of subsection two. The program also has as its object the amelioration of conditions of disadvantaged individuals or groups. The Crown describes numerous objectives for the program, which include negotiating solutions to Aboriginal fishing rights claims, providing economic opportunities to native bands, supporting their progress towards self-sufficiency. The means chosen to achieve the purpose, special fishing privileges for Aboriginal communities constituting a benefit, are rationally related to serving that purpose. Rational connection. The Crown has thus established a credible ameliorative purpose for the program. The program also targets a disadvantaged group identified by the enumerated or analogous grounds. The bans granted the benefit were disadvantaged in terms of income, education, and a host of other measures. This disadvantage, rooted in history, continues to this day. The fact that some individual members of the bans may not experience personal disadvantage does not negate the group disadvantage suffered by the band members. It follows that the program does not violate the equality guarantee of Section 15 of the Charter. Okay, and the final case in here was Fraser v. Canada of 2020. So the issue here was whether limitation on job shares' ability to buy back pension credits in the RCMP discriminates on basis of sex. And if it does, whether this infringement was justified by Section 1. So some background here. The claimants, three retired members of the RCMP, female, who took maternity leave in the early to mid-1990s. Upon returning to full-time service, they experienced difficulties combining their work obligations within their, with their child care responsibilities. At the time, RCMP did not permit uh, regular members to work part-time, but in December 1997, they introduced a job sharing program in which the members could split the duties and responsibilities of one full-time position. So these three claimants had enrolled in this job sharing program and they and most of the other members who job shared were women with children. Uh, RCMP members can treat certain gaps in full-time service such as leave without pay as fully pensionable, but job sharing um, was not held as being pensionable, even though they expected that it would. They were informed later that it is not. So they initiated an application arguing that the pension consequences of job sharing have a discriminatory impact on women, contrary to Section 15, Subsection 1 of the Charter. Their claim failed at the federal court, but then they, um, because the application judge found that job sharing is part-time work for which participants cannot obtain full-time credit. And this outcome did not violate, according to the judge, Section 15.1. The judge also held that there was insufficient evidence that the job sharing was disadvantageous compared to leave without pay. So they just, and the Court of Appeal then dismissed the appeal to that. But they were persistent. They went to the Supreme Court, uh, who held that this appeal should be allowed with the following analysis. Uh, Full-time RCMP members who job share must sacrifice pension benefits because of a temporary reduction in working hours. That's what they're dealing with. This arrangement has a disproportionate impact on women, perpetuates their historical disadvantage, a clear violation of their right to equality under Section 15, Subsection 1 of the Charter. Okay, some points from their analysis here. Um, to prove a violation of Section 15.1, a claimant must demonstrate that the impugned law or state action on its face or in its impact creates a distinction based on enumerated or analogous grounds and imposes burdens or denies a benefit in a manner that has the effect of reinforcing, perpetuating, or exacerbating disadvantage. So the claimants here contend that the negative pension consequences of job sharing infringe Section 15.1 because they have an adverse impact on women. Resolving their claim requires considering how adverse impact discrimination is applied. So adverse impact discrimination occurs when a seemingly neutral law has a disproportionate impact on members of groups protected on the basis of an enumerated or analogous ground. There is no doubt that adverse impact discrimination 
violates the norm of substantive equality, which underpins the court's equality jurisprudence. Substantive equality requires attention to the full context of the claimant's group's situation, to the actual impact of the law on that situation, and to the persistent systemic disadvantages that have operated to limit the opportunities available to that group's members. At the heart of substantive equality is the recognition that identical or facially neutral treatment may frequently produce serious inequality. This is precisely what happens when seemingly neutral laws ignore the true characteristics of a group which act as headwinds to the enjoyment of society's benefits. The same two-step approach to Section 15.1 applies regardless of whether the discrimination alleged is direct or indirect. At the first step, in order for a law to create a distinction based on prohibited grounds through its effects, it must have a disproportionate impact on members of a protected group. A law, for example, may include seemingly neutral rules, restrictions, or criteria that operate in practice as built-in headwinds for members of protected groups. In other cases, the problem is not headwinds built into a law, but the absence of accommodation for members of protected groups. Two types of evidence will be especially helpful in proving that a law has disproportionate impact. The first is evidence about the situation of the claimant group, so physical, social, cultural, or other barriers that provide a full context. Uh, and courts will also benefit from evidence about the outcomes that the impugned law or policy has produced in practice. Um, so this evidence might provide concrete proof that members of protected groups are being disproportionately impacted. This evidence may include statistics. Um, the weight given to statistics will depend on, among other things, their quality and methodology. Ideally, claims of adverse effects discrimination should be supported by evidence about the circumstances of the claimant group and the results produced by the challenge law. So both types of evidence. However, both kinds of evidence are not always required. In some cases, evidence about a group will show that a strong association with certain, certain traits that the disproportionate impact on members of that group will be apparent and immediate. Um, so in such cases, the evidence itself, the statistical evidence itself, is a compelling sign that the law has not been structured in a way that takes into account the group's circumstances. Both evidence of statistical disparity and of broader group disadvantage may demonstrate disproportionate impact, but neither is mandatory and their significance will vary depending on the case. Note whether the legislature intended to create a disproportionate impact is irrelevant. It's never been required to establish a Section 15.1 claim and even an ameliorative purpose is not sufficient to shield legislation from Section 15.1 scrutiny. Um, very interesting to note that. If claimants successfully demonstrate that a law has disproportionate impact on members of a, of a protected group, they don't also have to prove that the protected char characteristic caused the disproportionate impact. It's also unnecessary for them to prove that the law itself was responsible for creating the background social or physical barriers which made the particular rule requirement or criteria disadvantageous. In addition, claimants need not show that the impugned law affects all members of the protected group in the same way. The fact that discrimination is only partial does not convert it into non-discrimination, and differential treatment can occur on the basis of an enumerated ground despite the fact that not all persons belonging to the relevant group are mistreated. The, section, the second step of the Section 15 test is whether the law has the effect of reinforcing perpetuating or exacerbating disadvantage. And this will usually proceed similarly in cases whether it's direct or indirect. The goal is to examine the impact of the harm caused to the affected group, which has to be viewed in the light of any systemic or historical disadvantages faced by the claimant group. The presence of social prejudices or stereotyping are not necessary factors in this inquiry, and the perpetuation of disadvantage does not become less serious under Section 15.1 simply because it was relevant to a legitimate state objective. The test for a prima facie breach of Section 15.1 is concerned with the discriminatory impact of legislation on disadvantaged groups, not with whether the distinction is justified. That is an inquiry properly left to Section 1. Similarly, there is no burden on a claimant to prove that the distinction is arbitrary in order to prove a prima facie breach of Section 15.1. It is for the government 
to demonstrate that the law is not arbitrary in its justificatory submissions under Section 1. So, full-time RCMP members who work regular hours, who are suspended, who go on paid leave, can obtain full pension credit, but full-time members who temporarily reduce hours under a job-sharing agreement are classified as part-time and they cannot receive this credit. And so the question becomes, does this have a disproportionate impact on women? Um, so, of course, the government, uh, the RCMP argues that the claimants chose to job share and that should be grounds to dismiss their claim in the federal court. The Court of Appeal uh, believed, on that, believed that and held it and dismissed it. Um, but the Supreme Court has consistently held that differential treatment can be discriminatory even if it is based on choices made by the affected individual or group. And those a federal court and court of appeal also engaged in a formalistic comparison between the remuneration offered under job sharing and leave without pay, even though Section 15.1 guarantees the claimants and others in the job sharing program the right to substantive equality with respect to full-time RCMP workers. So under a proper assessment, says the Supreme Court, the Section 15.1 claim succeeds. The use of an RCMP member's temporary reduction in working hours as a basis to impose less favorable pension consequences plainly has a disproportionate impact on women. The relevant evidence showed that RCMP members who did work reduced hours and did get in this job sharing program were predominantly women with young children. These statistics were bolstered by compelling evidence about the disadvantages women face as a group in balancing professional and domestic work. This evidence shows the clear association between gender and fewer or less stable working hours and demonstrates that the RCMP's use of a temporary reduction in working hours as a basis for imposing less favorable pension consequences has an adverse impact on women. This adverse impact perpetuates a long-standing source of disadvantage to women, which is gender biases within pension plans. And they've been historically designed for middle and upper income full-time employees with long service, typically male. Because the RCMP's pension design perpetuates a long-standing source of economic disadvantage for women, there's a prima facie breach of Section 15 based on the enumerated ground of sex. Uh, so on to a bit of a Section 1 analysis here, because, okay, clearly we have a breach of Section 15. Is this justified under Section 1, which allows the state to justify a limit on a charter right as demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society? To start, the state must identify a pressing and substantial objective for limiting the charter right. So the Attorney General has identified no pressing and substantial policy concern, purpose, or principle that explains why these job shares should not be granted full-time pension. Um, it is clearly intended as a substitute for leave without pay. Um, so it is unclear what purpose is served by treating the two forms of work reduction differently. Uh, and the government did not offer a compelling objective for this differential treatment. So basically it can't be justified. It gets crushed right at the starting analysis of a section one analysis. Um, is it a pressing and substantial objective for limiting the charter right? No, it isn't. So since this breach of section 15 cannot be justified under section one, it is a violation of section 15.1 to preclude the claimants and their colleagues from buying back their pension credits. Um, and the appropriate remedy here uh, is a declaration that there has been a breach of these Section 15.1 rights, which will then put it back on the RCMP to fix this. So ends Section 15 of this NCA exam study guide. Best of luck on your NCA exams. Please, if you got value out of this video, smash that like button, comment, subscribe.